Hello and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you're having a wonderful beginning of a new year. And it is awesome to be able to start off this year with a wonderful webinar that we have prepared for you, ready to go and be able to present it to you in a format that you're going to be able to understand and appreciate. And to be able to make this happen, a wonderful experience for you and all of us. We have the wonderful Mr. Sam Crawley joining us. Hello, Sam. Hello, Javier. It's going to be a great uh, webinar today. Yes, I have all the no doubt about it, and I know it's going to be great information. So the webinar that we picked for this uh, first of the year for 2022, we're going to be talking about emergency action plan. And what should we know and do and how do we prepare for something that is so important and that is required by law to have for every company that is in the United States? Uh, some OSHAs uh, like federal or if not California have different stipulations, but they're all practically fall in line. And we are going to be covering the following topics regarding emergency action plan today. We're going to talk about what constitutes an emergency in the workplace, kind of an explanation, contents of the program, and what needs to be done by implementing the program. So this is something that we need to be prepared. But we want to know exactly what does constitute an emergency or what is the definition of an emergency? So a workplace emergency is an unforeseen event or situation that threatens the safety of a company, employee, customers, or public, and also that it may have consequences that could cause environmental damage and disrupt businesses all around. Now, emergencies could be of different natures, for example, uh, natural disasters like earthquakes, California, right? Hurricanes, tornadoes, floods. Those are emergencies that could be something that could be very devastating and very impactful on our businesses and our personnel. Also accidents, emergencies that could happen through fires, vehicle crashes, explosions would also constitute an emergency. And those are unforeseen events. Criminal activity, something, for example, that it, we see all the time nowadays, wow. robberies, for example, riots. That has become something that has been very, very common in the in television that we're seeing that uh, today. And also, it could be abrupt. It could happen at any moment or any time, depending on the industry that you are involved with. You so, know, and we are seeing a lot of those uh, crimes going on, Javier. Well, well, around. it is terrible. It is terrible. Lots We're seeing them. a lot of that. And it's impacting a lot of people. And some people are really caught off guard. Um, and as you can see in the videos, that has happened quite a bit. Right, Sam? That is for sure. Yeah. So having said all that and knowing what an emergency action plan constitutes, what it's involved, we have to have an emergency action plan in place. And that components of it uh, we need to be able to communicate. We need to be able to have some emergency services, uh, uh, training and plans as well, training and program evaluations throughout the year or periodically with the plan that we have developed. All right. So at a minimum, Sam, uh, we should have some type of way of communicating this emergency to our employees, correct? You do. So uh, you have to have some sort of um, way to communicate emergencies to your employees. That's a, either verbal PA, text messaging, cell phone, um, or even alarm systems like a fire alarm system um, or something to that uh, to that extent. Um, there, if you're if you have a fire alarm system, there are some specific requirements with that. Um, and it's all in Article 165, and you'll see at the bottom here, we've actually put the code. Um, so if you went into Google or something and put in um, Cal OSHA 6184, it would probably bring up the actual code within the first two hits or so. Um, so you could look at it. But it basically talks about how loud does the alarms have to be. Um, there has to be a different alarms for different emergencies. Um, it talks about testing the alarms um, and things like that, uh, but we won't get completely into that here. But um, if you do have alarm systems, there are requirements and you can find them here. 
Wonderful. So alarm systems that comply with Article 165, there are different variances that you need to look into. And definitely, this is something that is important to be able to communicate these this information to your employees. Um, also, uh, sometimes we're able not to kind of deal with some of the emergencies ourselves. So we need to be ready to call and have and notify external ex uh, uh, responders, like, for example, the fire department, right? Police. Uh, ambulances. And here we need to be able to make sure that we have the 911 ready uh, and be able to make that call and identify it and do it quickly. Sam, do you have any comments on that? Um, you, when you um, are, when you're looking at your um, labor law posters, you'll find a lot of different phone numbers around for clinics, um, physician, um, non-emergency numbers. Um, these are all great numbers for when you have issues that are non-emergencies. Um, so you just want to make sure that all your employees are trained that if you have a life-threatening emergency, you should be calling 911 and not one of the non-emergency lines. That's absolutely correct. So we need to be ready and ready to go with that. Okay, fantastic. Um, also, at a minimum, we should have uh, evacuation plans. Uh, uh, or maps uh, ready to be distributed around your facility or your work site. So then that way they could, uh, we kind of have an idea of where, what to do or where to go or be able to look them up to make sure that we kind of know what exit routes to take. Now, some emergency evacuation maps may not be compliant. What makes an ev evacuation plan, or excuse me, map compliant and what does not? What are the differences, Sam? So if you look at this emergency uh, evacuation map, it, it looks like it shows you where you are. It tells you where you need to go and what staircases you should use, but it doesn't tell you anything else. When we're looking at, uh, at a business who has an emergency evacuation map, what we want to see um, are, of course, the layout of the entire facility, um, the exits of that facility, the paths that people should be taking, depending on where they are in the facility. Um, on the outside of it, you should have some sort of compass or even mark the streets that are around your facility so that you can use it for direction. Um, because you're also going to put out there um, meeting spaces, and you'll need two, one either on opposite sides of the building. And the reason you need two is, is if you have a fire or some sort of emergency, and the first meeting spot is not a very good one to go. Maybe the smoke is all blowing into meeting spot one. You need another one to go to um, that uh, is a lot safer for your employees. And sometimes what happens is we may be able to put information that is not required on these emergency evacuation maps that are not necessary that we may think that are important, but they really are over cluttered. So if you have a, a map that is completely cluttered, could you confuse someone who's looking for information right away? You probably could. Information overload. Uh, definitely. Definitely. So, so one of the things that we want to make sure is that we're clean that we're simple, but we meet that criteria that Sam just mentioned. Uh, you are here is a very important uh, part of it. Uh, locations, all the information that uh, has been mentioned should be outlined in a way that it's simple and read and easy to read. And um, one one other thing that I would mention, to Javier, is that uh, when when we go out to do inspections at a lot of places, we'll look at the emergency action map and the actual um, way that you're supposed to travel to the exit it's actually different in real life. Um, the map directions do not match what real life directions for, for the exit are. Um, so you wanna make sure that when you make a map, it actually uh, relates size. to where the actual right. Right. Uh, exits are. That's right. So we got to make sure that they're accurate and they're depicting the exact physical locations of those exits, correct? That is correct. Wonderful. Also, we should be able to uh, train our employees to make sure that they assist any individuals that maybe are not part of the facility or maybe they're visiting, that they should be able to be uh, kind of helped out and uh, evacuate a building if there is an emergency who are maybe visiting, for example. Visitors could be actually be involved and they may need be help, uh, needing help to, to exit that uh, location. Right, right on. Right on. Okay. Um, also, we want to make sure that a minimum that we should have and train employees 
on being able to know that maybe there's an emergency going on, but whatever you may be doing in addition, just part of the process, uh, that maybe if we don't control those measures, actually it could create an additional emergency or situation that could be hazardous to everyone involved. So here are some of the things that you want to do is you want to be able to assign and give and identify some of the procedures to shut down the system, maybe machines, maybe protocols on certain things that may be going on. And we want to do it in a way where everybody be able to do that before they actually exit. Sam, any thoughts on that? So um, you, you're, you're right. You've got to have people that have specific tasks to shut down emergency services, um, gas lines, electricity, machines that are running. Um, and a lot of people will assign one uh, person to this. You really want to make sure that you're assigning multiple people to these jobs um, that uh, in case uh, on the day of the emergency, if somebody's sick or they're on vacation, that uh, you have enough people to handle what uh, what emergencies uh, come up. So you need to have more than one person assigned to each task, uh, whether that be shutting down those emergency services, taking roll call at the meeting areas, um, or you know any anything else that might come up. And these uh, procedures should be detailed in the evacuation map as That's listed. Correct. All right, fantastic. Okay, here also we want to, you did mention about taking an account of all employees. Uh, so 100 people came in to work, 80 people are now uh, present at your staging area, 20 people are missing, who are they? How many are actually there who are not there? So uh, there should be a, a procedure for people who are responsible to take an account of bill or an account of employees who are present in the staging area. Now, not necessarily supervisors, right? Like here it says supervisors, but it's uh, whoever you assign that is responsible to do so. Correct, Sam? Yeah, somebody who's responsible, somebody uh, who can take charge and, um, and, and handle the pressure because there's a lot of pressures and worries in emergencies. So you got to right. get the right person. That's right. And one of the things, because we have an emergency action plan, is to, to have an orderly way of uh, uh, dealing with this an emergency. Uh, sometimes the pressure could be so horrific, depending on the, on the emergency, that people could actually lose it or they, they're afraid or they panic. The breakdown. So we, want, we want somebody to have kind of a personality to be able to take, uh, take matters into their own hand, just say, hey, calm down, let's get this done, right? Yep. Right on. Okay, that, that's it. So that's very important. All right. So uh, also in the emergency action plan, we want paramedics or other outside medical services to, that we can rely on. So they, we need to be able to have information and ready for them when they come in to assist us. And this is what we're going to talk about now. So here, for example, let's say that we cannot, uh, we cannot have uh, uh let's say first responders right away. Could there be an emergency where maybe it could be a delay for them to come to your place? Could that be an issue? Uh, that could definitely be an issue. Um, so when we're talking about, um, and this is a common question that we get uh, from companies is, do I have to have uh, trained first aid and CPR uh, people on, on site? Um, and the the answer is yes and no, depending on uh, where you work or what you're doing. For instance, in construction, um, you're required to have people on site that are certified in CPR and first aid. Um, when it comes to general industry, um, if your location is uh, no more than five minutes away from access to paramedics or this kind of help, then you would not be required to have uh, CPR first aid certified people on, on site. Um, but wow. that's five minutes. Think about how quick five minutes goes by. I mean, if you're in okay. Los Angeles, you can't go anywhere in five minutes. <laughs> oh, with that traffic, yeah, if you're lucky you'll get a couple of feet uh, in progress. Yeah, so it's very, very important to understand that we may not be able to do uh, get first responders right away. So we need to be prepared. So in construction, Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, everyone needs to be first aid certified or have someone there to be able to help people in case there's an emergency, correct? 
So um, well, you said everyone, but not everyone has to be uh, certified in first aid and CPR, but you have to have adequate numbers of people to handle the amount of employees that you have there. Okay. Now, how about for, uh, let's say, uh, the industry for agriculture, like tree trimming or tree services? Now, how about them? Uh, tree, uh, if you... Working uh, teams. Right. If you're working on uh, a company that cuts down trees, uh, you are required, your entire team is required to be certified in first aid and CPR. Um, there's no question about that. Um, okay. From every level on the team, everybody has to have it. So there are some industries like this, like tree working team, that they have to be first aid certified, every single one, correct? Right. So if you're a landscaping company and you have people that go and cut down trees sometimes, uh, when they're working on trees, they're required to have uh, first aid and CPR certifications. Got it. Got it. So now what happens if, let's say, I'm in a construction site and I'm of one of many uh subcontractors working in a in a, on a project uh sh should i do i need to at that point have any anybody that is first aid certified in my team could i just rely on the superintendent or somebody so you, else yeah so you can't just rely on the general contractor um every company um should have somebody on site who is uh, certified in cpr or first aid um but the code says that you have to have a um, the appropriate amount of trained employees for, for how many employees you have. So it doesn't necessarily say that everybody's got to have it, but everybody has to have um, access to them and you have to have enough to work uh, with the people that you have. Wonderful. So a lot of times it does come down to you should at least have one person in your company that uh, is on site that is certified CPR and first aid. So there you go. So even though I may be joining other groups or maybe there's a lot, I should not just uh, think that I'm exempt from having someone in my company to be able to be first aid certified and be ready to go and also be able to work with a pool of other uh, first responders that could be in a job site along with ourselves to be able to contribute to that emergency in reacting and helping people and trying to rescue people that could be in trouble. So that's right. Wonderful. That is wonderful. All right. Perfect. That that uh, really explains quite a bit. All right. So in an emergency, first aid kits obviously become a very important part of an emergency action plan. And uh, construction uh, sites are required to have these kits. And do we have responsibilities with these kits? And do we are we supposed to be doing certain things? Sam? Um, so uh, can every site's required to have a first aid kit, obviously. Um, and, and construction is uh, no uh, different. It's required to have it. Absolutely. So because we have these first aid kits and we need to have them ready, there are some responsibilities that we need to make sure that we're complying with. For example, a kit should not be, you know, like in a, in a bag or something, right? It has to be in a weatherproof container that could keep the items fresh, ready to go. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but sometimes in some locations, some job sites or work sites, um, People will have like a little cut or they have something and then they go into the kit and they start doing what? Taking uh, uh, articles of the kit uh, and start applying it to themselves, but they never report it correctly. And what is the outcome of something like this? Well, uh, if you have employees that are uh, not reporting uh, accidents or things like this, this is where uh, a company could get in trouble with um Injuries that come on several days later because the employee didn't sterilize something correctly or the first aid kit wasn't kept in the proper condition and uh, uh, nothing's working well or everything's dirty in it. Not only that, but also I think you're de uh, you're depleting your materials that you're required to have in the kit, right? And this now if you too. have a, a, another emergency or, God forbid, a real emergency in the sense of life. Or, you, you got know, nothing. Now you have an empty kit, and that's because nobody inspected it or reported it. So one of the things we want to do is periodically inspect and make sure that everything's in there. And it's something that is very important to do. Also, we want to make sure you mentioned sanitation, sanitary. We want to make sure that everything is clean, that they're in their containers, correct? 
and we want to make sure that everything is 100% clean and ready to go. Right on. Right? All right. Also, uh, we should also kind of have a determination whether we need a, a, an authorized physician to be able to kind of uh, give authorization on certain lists of items that we will have. And we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, further in the, in the, in the web, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the program, but uh, that is something that we have to look out as well. Okay. So for construction sites, uh, could I just have anything that I want uh, for construction uh, industry? No, not for construction. Uh, there is actual code that uh, dictates exactly what you should have in your first aid kit. All right. All right. Specific. So here we have so here we have a list of actually kind of a format of the items that are required to have. And also it is uh, uh, in the construction uh, work sites. It is required by the number of employees. Is that correct, Sam? It is correct. Um, and uh, one thing that God Safety has done to try to make everybody's life easier um, is we have started a new program for uh, for state cuts. So if you are somebody who uh, needs first aid kits or buys a lot of these things, um, gets supplies for them, uh, we have started to supply these first aid kits. And uh, we've gotten them at a price that um, will uh, beat most anybody else. Um, we just want to make uh, it easy and convenient for our clients to, to stay compliant. Wonderful. And uh, one of the things is sometimes, you know, there may be uh, – uh, things that you need right away. And I'm sure we have plenty of stock and be able to ship it right away. Right, Sam? Absolutely. Oh, wonderful. That, that is a wonderful service to have. And if our, any of you need it, uh, you have now that available source for you to be able to get uh, materials from uh, if you need it right away. All right. Fantastic. So first aid kits. Uh, now, what happens if you have uh, over-the-counter medication? Uh, or in your kits, or you have certain uh, supplies like antiseptics. Uh, could we just have them like that normally, or what else? What are the requirements for that? So when it um, when it comes to oral medication, um, you are to to have oral medication in your first aid kits. You're required to have um, a physician's authorization letter stating that uh, it's okay, or he approves the, this kit for your. Uh, employees. Um, and that would include any type of pill that you take orally. Tums um, would count as well. Aspirin, Tylenol, cold pills, um, anything that you put in your mouth and swallow. That would be required to have a physician's letter. So so that's very important to have. Okay, fantastic. So, and and if we do not have a, a physician's letter, we, we're not complying, correct? You could be cited for that, yes. Okay, so there you go. So we want to make sure that we have those authorized letters, and we want to make sure that we're compliant if we are going to be carrying any kind of medication or over-the-counter uh, medicine, right? That is correct. Okay, fantastic. Now, for general industry, uh, is it the same, or is uh, that still applies, or what are the differences with general industry? So a general industry, there is no code that specifically tells you what you should have in your first aid kit. It's different. Um, really what they say is you should talk to a physician and um, through talking with him, decide on what you should have in your kit. Um, but what's a, uh, what we've seen a lot is that um, if you just mimic what is actually required in construction and bring it over to the general industry, you're, you're going to have a compliant kit. It's got all of the stuff that you'll need. Um, and it is something that even Cal OSHA requires. Um, so I would recommend that you go that route. It's probably a good idea. So even though it is a little bit different than uh, construction, general industry still needs to have all the requirements of inspections, sanitary conditions, usable product. But we also want to make sure that it applies to the industry that you're working with. So let's say if I have if I'm working in the desert and there's a lot of rattlesnakes, uh, we should have certain components in the kit that apply for that industry. Correct, Sam? Yes, they should be. Uh, you should, okay. even though you're getting in the basic idea of your kit through um, a, maybe a, uh, the construction code, um, it still has to be built for what you're doing. And uh, rattlesnake bite is probably a very good example. 
Yeah, there you go. So we want to be able to fit our kit for our industry. And uh, definitely, if you need any further information or any help with that, call us um, on our 1-800 number, and we'll be able more than happy to give you all the information that you yep. need regarding your industry. Fantastic. And we can help with that. That's awesome. All right. Speaking, speaking well, of bites, it kind of <laughs> looks like a rattlesnake bite. It, or if not, that's a very large spider. I'll tell you, that looks more like a tarantula bite too. It could be that as well. Exactly. But all employees should be informed and trained on procedures in case there's an emergency, what they need to do. And we're going to talk about that. So uh, medical transportation. Now, let's say there's an emergency and uh, it happened all of a sudden. And here we are and we're calling. And all of a sudden, this uh, let's say this facility is huge and we have a whole array of departments and the first responders arrive and we have no idea where to direct them. Could that be a problem? Uh, that could definitely be a problem. Uh, you want to make sure that all of your uh, people are trained and uh, everybody knows what they should be doing. So we should all know, for example, directions, the phone numbers. We should know how to communicate. Uh, so I guess here what we're talking about is time is of the essence, correct? Time yep. is ticking. So if we are organized with our phone numbers, knowing who to call, having, for example, directions of facilities of what where the uh, the emergency may be, if it's not a general emergency, then here we could actually help the people that are in trouble quickly and efficiently, and I think we could save lives that way. Yep, absolutely. All right. So we want to have all that information ready and available. Okay. We also have safety equipment that could be uh, helping, uh, uh, you know, in case there's an injury. Uh, for example, like eye wash stations or showers. And uh, so what? How, how about these showers and eye wash stations? What are the protocols that we need to have, Sam? So in construction, um, having an eyewash and shower uh, on site can be a real challenge in a lot of situations. Um, you don't see a lot of showers on uh, construction sites. However, you do see a lot of eyewashes. Um, you can buy uh, portable eyewash stations that um, you can just put on a cart and wheel them around. Uh, they are 15 minutes of, um, of run time on them, uh, which make them compliant. Uh, so that's a good idea. General industry, um, you need a uh, you need an eye wash and shower uh, any time that you're working with something that um, can be bad for your skin or eyes. Um, and uh, to figure that out, you got to look at your SDS sheets and you got to do maybe a hazard analysis or, or job task analysis, sir. Absolutely. To Absolutely. figure that out. That's right. So, yeah. So uh, general industry, um, when I do inspections, it's a very common to see eye wash stations uh, and showers. But in construction, uh, maybe because of the portability, like you said, Sam, it, uh, they're, they're not uh, read, uh, readily available. Where I have not seen that many. But that doesn't mean they are not required to have them. Is that correct, Sam? Uh, that is correct. So they're not exempt. Is that correct? That's correct. They're not exempt. All right. They're so they're not then, exempt. So here you go. So no matter, regardless, in a construction site, going through a job hazard analysis, like Sam said, you will find out if you need one or, or if you need to have one accessible. And then the way to do it is by consulting safety data sheets, uh, yep. doing a job hazard analysis. Okay. And it's very piece. I mean, this has saved many lives and a lot of people's skin uh, once they've been exposed to toxic materials, I'm sure. I've seen these uh, save a lot of uh, people from a lot of uh, harm. So yeah, they sure. are important. And imagine not having it when you need it. It could cause some serious uh, problems, I'm sure. And and just to say that uh, in California, I uh, bottled eye washes are not compliant. No, there you go. So those are not. Why are they not compliant? Well, they don't run for 15 minutes. So if there you is. are relying on bottled eye wash as your eye wash station, your emergency eye wash station, then you are not compliant. And um if you get caught, it will end badly. It will so, end with citations. And yeah, it could it could end with worse injuries to the employee because you didn't have an eyewash station. It would run for 15 minutes. Now, some people would say, well, how come then? Why do they sell them? Why are they available? Because they're actually not supposed to be your primary uh, station for actually a 15-minute uh, emergency setup, right? It's well, only an auxiliary, right? 
Well, in other states, the bottled eyewash uh, in, is compliant. It's just not compliant in California. Wow. Wow. But if you have a safety data sheet that says 15 minute water supply should be given to your employee and you have one of these bottles, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because it won't run 15 work. minutes. That's it. There you bottom line. So please evaluate your area, do a job hazard analysis and uh, put the appropriate equipment to be able to help your personnel stay safe if there is an emergency regarding these exposures. Fantastic. Wonderful. Okay. Now, this is a good one. There, there needs to be in your emergency plan when there's construction. So let's say you're on a site and that you're working five stories high or above or 48 feet high or below underground. How do you communicate with a massive amount of people in that type of a structure you need to have some type of a system to be able to communicate with them. So here you have to have like an emergency call systems available. Is that correct, Sam? Yeah. So um, ever, if you're working on a site that uh, with a building that is either that deep or that tall, you've got to have some sort of way to um, uh, call uh, elevators for uh, emergencies. A lot of times you'll see those little uh, boxes um, near the elevators that will uh, just shout on every single floor. That's um, right. So a lot of times you'll see that. Right. And also, please, if there is an emergency, those elevators are supposed to be used for uh, personnel that are injured. They need to be able to be available to them before you actually start exiting. So don't shove anybody who's injured and then you go on ahead if you're OK. That would be <laughs> correct. Right. You don't want to do that. Yeah, that'd you know, be a bad idea. Yeah, that would not be a good thing. Please be courteous on that one. All right. Fantastic. So there you go. We want to have to have a system of communication when we have large construction sites, especially if we're working in elevated areas above 80, 48 uh, feet. OK. Um, also, when you're working at those kind of levels, uh, imagine uh, trying to help somebody who's injured and cannot walk or anything like that. Imagine trying to carry them. That would be pretty difficult, I think, climbing five stories down or up trying to help this individual. So we do need to make sure that if you are falling under that criteria of 40, 48 feet or five stories high or below, we need to have a litter basket. And what is a litter basket, Sam? Uh, well, um, initially one might think that it's something that you would use to rescue kittens because um, it's a litter. <laughs> Yeah. It's just a strange name. <laughs> strange uh, that name. is right. a strange name. It is a strange name. But what? Right. What? Why do they call it a litter basket? Uh, I. Did, why do they call it a litter equipment? I, I have no idea why they call it that. Uh, right. But I call it a basket. All and, right. Uh, it's you use it to get people out of buildings um, that can't walk or remove themselves from the building. That's it. That's uh, and it. this is a requirement when you're. Uh, at a certain level, I believe it's 48 feet. I'm thinking uh, when they call it litter, uh, you know, it's because we're talking about added uh, material that you need in order to be able to help an individual. For example, maybe you need straps, blankets, maybe something to keep somebody warm and it should be in your basket. And maybe that's why they call it litter basket, I guess. And then uh, that could be. emergency equipment or materials in order for the emergency response. Maybe that's what it is, right? That, that absolutely could be. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting name, but we are required to have it. And boy, it's going to make whoever's rescuing somebody, it's going to make it a lot easier to transport this injured person for sure. That is for sure. For sure. So this is a, a definitely a good, a good thing. Now, training. Okay, so... Here we go, we go, we developed a, uh, an emergency action plan. Uh, we put all these minimum components in there. So if we have all this set up, now we must communicate that to everyone involved and train all our employees regarding this emergency action plan. And definitely this is something that it's very important. So what should we train on? So the training should be specific to maybe uh, your site plan, what uh, the, where the maps are, for example, what are the responsibilities of each individual, whether they have an assignment or not, 
Uh, also making sure that you're testing their knowledge uh, of understanding of those uh, maybe assigned tasks that they've been given. Um, also uh, kind of training them to understand the way to communicate, uh, how to communicate, how to be able to uh, kind of recognize the different alarms that actually have been put in place, right? We talked about Proposition 16, not Proposition, but Article 165. And those are the things that we want to be able for them to know. Also, we want to be able to have, uh, for them to know how to be able to help other people in case they are hurt, uh, to assist them, to be able to help them. And the, believe it or not, one of the most important things in training is to teach for people to stay calm and to cooperate in case there is an emergency. The worst thing that you could have is someone panicking and creating more of a chaos, more disruption within the emergency that could actually cause serious consequences and it could cause somebody more injuries or if not even death. So definitely training is very important. Uh, any any uh, any uh, thoughts on that, Sam? So this is uh, you know this section is where um, you know minutes could mean lives. Uh, minutes could be either your entire facility burning down, um, or uh, you know just a small portion of it. Uh, so making sure that your employees are well trained in their roles and what they're supposed to do, and how they're supposed to react. Maybe you have a person uh, working at a dangerous spot over here, working with uh, electricity, and he's uh, being electrocuted. You should have plans for all types of emergency. If somebody's stuck on something, how do you get them off? What do you use? Um, right. you, you need to know these things and make sure that it's trained into your employees, um, because the seconds could be life or death. And by having that training, man, the response time just drops. You're able to be efficient and hopefully you're able to save that person. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So training, very important to communicate that. Now, also the frequency of that training is very important, Sam. I think so. Um, so we understand that. Let's say I've gotten certain uh, uh, experiences that I've had where I've gone and People have actually done everything that we put here in our web, uh, in our uh, uh, webinar that we've mentioned today, but they haven't reviewed that in two years. Could that be a problem? That would be a problem. You've got to uh, do um, annual uh, checks on your emergency plan to make sure that everything is the same, nothing's changed, and everything is correct. But knowing that, we uh, through experience, you know, Sam, that uh, most emergency action plans, it's kind of an evolving plan. It's never stagnant. There's things that could change, right? Uh, exit paths, um, people uh, could be changed out. That would change um, the people who are doing the specific jobs. There you, go. Uh, you may need to train people on new jobs. Uh, when you're dealing with the emergency action plan. Um, right. So there's lots of things that could change in the plan. And when Absolutely. that changes, and when that changes, then we need to do what? A review and training of our plan again, correct? That is correct. So what, that's where the frequency comes in. So we should do it when we first initially implement the plan. We should do that training. Also, when responsibilities have changed or maybe we're assigning different things, uh, maybe we need to do a refresher. How about a drill? Do we do a drill? Could things pop up when we're doing a drill? They need to be changed. Then we need to do a, a, address that those issues and do another training, right? So, and things do change. So be ready to have that frequency. Just don't forget about it. Make sure you're communicating that, that training. Absolutely. All right. Fantastic. So, in conclusion, what we have here is this. I hope that this webinar has actually ignited or sparked an interest in your emergency action plan. And the question here really, it is huge. Have you reviewed it? Do you have an emergency action plan? Have you, have you done any training recently on changes that you've had done unexpectedly? Are you ready for any type of emergency that could affect your particular industry? Have you done or gone through experiences that you've had an emergency and you needed to make adjustments? All these things come into play. So starting off in January for 2022, it is an absolutely wonderful topic to talk about for you to be able to start crossing off all the required things that you need so that way you can be compliant. 
Remember, they have to be in writing. Your plan has to be communicated. You want to make sure that all your first aid kids are ready to go and they apply to your industry. Also, you want to make sure that everyone knows their assignments, that everyone understands that it's very easy for one to panic in a situation like that, to also learn to have that self-control and remember the training that we've gone through so we could go through the steps efficiently, without panic, and being able to carry it out in such a way that we could save our own lives and somebody else's lives. Sam, would you like to add anything to this conclusion? So um, if uh, your clients of ours, uh, we write uh, your documentation, we write these programs for you. Um, if you are a client of ours and uh, we haven't written your documentation uh, because you chose to use your own, um, we are more than happy to just give us a call. We can help you out with this. It'll be easy for you. We keep it updated um, for the life of your account. Um, so you don't have to worry about whether your uh, program is compliant or not as as specifically to the writing of it. Um, we'll be more than happy to help you um, figure out what type of things that you need to put into this program and how you should do it. Uh, would love to help you. Um, and I have one more shameless uh, plug to put on on the next slide, Javier. Um, so to just finish up, like what I was talking about earlier, um, we, we do now uh, offer first aid kits. Um, these things are, are great. They're easy to use um, and uh, they'll be cheap. They are inexpensive. Um, we're just looking to help people out and make, make, uh, make it easier to run a company. Um, so check it out. We'd love to help you. Wonderful. Um, everything that God Safety does is to be able to assist and help our clients uh, just make it seamless. You have a lot to worry about to do day-to-day -day operations. It's already, it's daunting, I'm sure. Uh, we're just here to be able to make your life easier. So we're ready to help you. You can call our 1-800 number, 734-3574. We have people there that are ready to help you and assist you on all kinds of questions. And talking about questions, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to our Q&A portion. If you have any questions, please let us know right now. We're here available to be able to answer that. Haven, do we have any questions uh, uh, that we can answer? I do have seven or eight questions for you guys. Uh, the biggest one everyone's asking about the slide. So if you go to your files menu, the icon looks like a paper clip. You guys can now download these slides. Um, so the next question I have, uh, one of the one of the attendees answered it, but they wanted to know, is there a program that can help create such a map for the evacuation plan, those evacuation maps? Someone suggested Mapistry. Do you guys know of any other ones? I don't know of any um, particular program that can uh, automatically create these uh, type of uh, maps. I don't. Um, but that sounds okay. like a good suggestion, Mapistry. I haven't, Mapistry. I haven't used it before. Okay. So another attendee asked, do they need to uh, update the EAP every year, even if nothing has changed? Well, if you have an emergency action plan and nothing has changed, um, then but there's nothing to update. Right. If nothing's changed. Um, but I would suggest uh, that if, if you find that nothing has changed, uh, that's going to be a very small number of people that fall into that category. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but there's going to be a small amount of uh, companies that fall into that, that nothing has changed. Not a person has changed. I mean, nothing. Um, but if nothing's changed, then no, you don't have to. It, it is updated. I would, I, one, would, one could argue. All right. The next question comes from several different industries, but mostly construction and landscapers. Do they need a plan for their crews that work outside and EAP for their crews that work outside? Um, they do. And part of their uh, emergency action plan will be all of the local uh, clinics, hospitals, um, you know, fire departments. Uh, those are all things that you're required to have in your emergency action plan. Um, local physician clinics, things like that. Um, some, uh, some companies will say, well, I, I go to different places all throughout the city. Um, how do I, uh, how do I ensure that I have the, um, numbers and phone numbers for all of these individual places? Um, what I've seen 
is uh, you, you've got to say, all right, I work in this city and uh, you've got to now start collecting all of those phone numbers for clinics, hospitals, fire departments, um, and categorize them on a list in particular cities and provide that to your employees. So when they are in a particular city, you don't have to continually rewrite this thing over and over and over again. Um, you just have one book, um, part of your emergency action plan, and they can turn to what city they're in and find every local um, uh, facility that they need to find. Javier? No, absolutely. And also, uh, one of the things I know people go, oh my gosh, we got like so many hospitals, but uh, definitely you want to be able to find an emergency room that can provide uh, emergency uh, response to something that is uh, life threatening. Um, and here, uh, you know, you have some some hospitals that actually cover a very large regions within a city. So it's not as daunting as you may think. Um, so it's something that is simple that you could do if you start formulating that. Once you start going, your, your plan could be uh, set in motion and you're gonna find it easier than it really sounds like. Yeah. Okay, um, the next attendee wanted to know, is there a ratio of how many how many employees to how many should be certified? She says she has four office employees and five out in the field. How many should be CPR certified? Um, well, the code states that you should have uh, enough to uh, uh, enough to handle uh, any issues that come up. So uh, let's say that your five employees always work together. Um, out in the field, and you only have one employee that's certified um, in those two things. What if he's sick that day? Now you're stuck in a situation where you don't have anybody. Um, so when when you're talking about how many people should I have uh, certified, you've got to think about that. So if you have a small crew, it's still going to be probably a larger number because you've got to uh, guess who's going to call out sick or you know who's going to be on vacation that week because um, you've always got to have somebody. Um, so it's going to be a, a higher number. It, it, if not all of them, um, it might just be all of them. But the code's not specific. It says that you need to have an uh, uh, the, um, the right number. Correct. Okay, and this is related to that same question. They're saying the fire department is two blocks away from their business. Does that mean they do not need any CPR-trained employees? So the code says that uh, if you have access to something within five minutes, then uh, you can rely on that. Um, but that's what the code says. Right. Um, that will have to be a determination that you make. Can these fire departments get here within five minutes? Um, there's, there's no way that uh, I would here be able to tell you whether you need to have that or not. Um, but five minutes. If they're two blocks away, it might be uh, you might be in a, a safe place um, where they can get to you within five minutes. Um, but the code is five minutes. All right. And this next one's related to over the counter med medications. If they are available at someone's desk, do they still need a physician's letter? Um, if the medications are being issued by the company, then yes. Um, and what what I, what does uh, being distributed by the company mean? Um, if you have a manager who keeps it in his desk and gives it to the people under him, that would be um, distribution by the company. Um, compared to self self medicated. So compared yes, compared to somebody keeping medication in their own desk and using it for themselves, that's completely right. different. Very different. Okay, we got two left. This one deals with eyewash stations. Is the requirement only if there is corrosive material present? No. No. <laughs> it, it is not. Um, it, uh, it's for anything that can irritate uh, your skin. There's all kinds of things that may not necessarily be corrosive, uh, but can irritate your skin. Um, or your eyes. Or your eyes for that matter. I mean, even if you got, uh, you know, dust in your eye or, you know, a um, sliver, um, maybe you work in a metal facility and there's metal shavings flying all over the place. Um, it could be, it could be any reason that uh, you get something in your eye. 
All right. And then is there a frequency requirement for building evacuation drills in California? Should they be done so often? Um, so uh, I would say that there is no California code that dictates uh, exactly um, on drills. However, I, I would say that uh, if you've got a building with, say, 14 people in it, it's going to be pretty easy for you to uh, train your employees on how to do these drills. But if you have a large company with multiple departments um, over a large piece of property, um, this is going to be a situation where you probably are going to want to do some sort of drill um, so that you can figure out where the weaknesses are in the system so that you can build it better. Um, find out where mistakes are being made, or uh, maybe there's something they haven't thought of uh, when it comes to the evacuation. You're only going to really be able to figure this stuff out is if you do drills. Um, I'm not saying that you got to do them all the time, but it would be a very good idea um, if you're a very large company like that to do some sort of drill uh, to help train your employees. That could fall right under training. Javier? Well, yeah. Also, um, you know, I remember when I was a kid in elementary, they used to train us on drills. To, if there was a fire, we'd all line up, get going. And the reason they did the drills was because actually the physical with the mental, it all fuses together knowing what to do physically. And it's just like a, a memory uh, organ. You, you just, if there's an emergency, everybody tends to uh, do a better job of evacuating a building. And it's, uh, uh, it's just, uh, it's beneficial to any organization or any company to do a drill. It's not a, ne a detriment, it's actually a positive thing. So I highly recommend at least once a year. Good. All right, and real quick before we sign off, I did have one more pop in. Does every employee need to be fire extinguisher trained? Or yes, just certain employees. They all do. They all do. Um, and any any one employee can can be the guy to to save the whole building uh, with a small little fire. So if you've got employees that don't know how to fire use a fire extinguisher, holy crap, That's you right. got uh, you got you get bigger problems than you, you think you have. If they can't use a fire extinguisher, good habits. But yes, they need training. And you've got to have a signature of that employee um, that says he's trained. Just saying that he's, tra that he's trained is not enough. And we recommend, matter of fact, we recommend that uh, safety training. We have one in our modules just for that particular reason, for them to be prepared. Right on. Fire extinguisher, yep. Yeah. Well, that's all the questions that I have. So if Wonderful. anyone else has any other questions, I think I saw a couple in the string. Uh, you can always email me, uh, sam at gotsafety.com, uh, and uh, I'll do my best to uh, answer any other questions that you might have. Um, but, uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Thank you very much, everyone. So if that's it, have a wonderful month. Sam, thank you very much for all your knowledge and all the information provided. And to all of you, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care. See you, Javier. Bye-bye.